Hello again, everyone. You guys have asked for more home lab videos, so be careful what you wish for because that's what you're getting. In this video, I want to talk about the new storage server that I'm building that is actually going to replace my PowerEdge R710. I'm going to tell you guys exactly why I made the decision to rebuild it, the parts that I decided to go with, what my goals are. I'm going to go through the entire process of replacing my storage server, and you guys are going to see the entire process in this video. So as you can see in front of me right now, I have all the parts that I need to build this server. But before I show that, I'm going to talk about what my goals are in this project. And then I'm going to go ahead and show you each of these parts individually. And then I'll build it and then show you the final product. So I'm going to go ahead and clear my desk and then we'll go ahead and talk about the goals. So there's a few reasons why I decided to rebuild my storage server. There's nothing wrong with it. A PowerEdge R710, well, that's a pretty good server. You can get one for a pretty good price on eBay, and they're really stable, so what's wrong with it? Well, there's several things that I wanted to accomplish in this project. Now, the first lesson that I learned about Home Lab is don't be impulsive about buying whatever comes available first if you plan on buying, you know, physical servers. Again, there's nothing wrong with an R710. It's a great server. But you know, for one thing, it's kind of loud. It uses more power than I would like. I would love to have the servers in the studio so you guys can see it in the background. I mean, how cool would that be if I had my server rack in the background? I can't do that because it's loud as heck and there's no way you would even be able to hear me talk. So, you know, you want to do some research when you go and buy servers and I didn't do that. Now the servers I have are fine, but I decided to go a different direction. So let's put aside the fact that the server rack is relatively loud for a moment and focus on another reason that I'd like to talk about, and that's power usage. Now, to be fair, the electric costs where I live, they're not astronomical. Some areas in the world, I mean, power usage costs more in some places than others, and in this area it's not that bad. But I don't want to use any more power than I absolutely need to because, you know, the more money you save, the more money you can spend on cool stuff and cool gear, right? I mean, to be fair, the elephant in the room is that I've probably spent more on this hardware than I'm going to save in the power usage, and it's going to take me quite a long time to break even. But it's much more than that. I, I basically want to be as green as I possibly can, and this is just one step in the process, and I don't want to waste power. I think that this is going to be a better fit. And overall, you know, there's several smaller reasons that have gone into this decision that I won't bore you with. But I wanted to give you guys, you know, the higher level details of why I decided to do this. And besides, it's a fun project to build a server. And I think ultimately I'm going to be happier with something that I've built myself than something that I've sourced from eBay. Nothing wrong with getting home lab gear from eBay. But I think for me personally, I want to be able to build every component. And it's just going to be fun. And I think you guys will probably enjoy seeing it as well. All right, so before I get to the actual build, I wanted to show you guys a few things first. So first of all, this is one last look at my R710, because as soon as this new server gets up and running, this one's going away. So I've shown you this server before. We currently have an L5630 CPU in this R710. That's the CPU that powers my FreeNAS unit. And you can see that I'm not really utilizing it all that much. Obviously, when I'm doing some kind of a cloud sync or some kind of work, that will jump up. But it never really seems to get all that high. If I scroll down a bit here, you can see that I have 1.6 terabytes free. If I go over here to storage and then pools, you can see that we have about an 8 terabyte volume here. Now, the new volume, once I get everything built, will consist of four 6 terabyte drives. And that's going to give me 12 terabytes of usable space if you take into consideration that two of the four drives will be used for parity. So I guess what that means is, well, this is going to be bumped up a little bit once I get everything built. But I wanted to show you guys this server one last time as a point of comparison against the new one once I have it built. Now the next thing I want to show you guys is this right here. 
This is the Dell Remote Access Controller, or iDRAC screen, and this is basically a console on Dell servers you can log into to do various things. And you know what, this is really old school. It requires Java just to do a virtual console. And I think that's lame because I don't really want to install Java just to facilitate that. What that used to allow you to do, and will still allow you to do if you manage to get Java integrated in just the right way, it'll allow you to remote control your server and even boot it from an ISO file. It's actually pretty sweet, but again, it's old and it's a little bit long in the tooth here. And it does require Java, so it has to go. But specifically, what I want to show you is if I go here to Power Monitoring, now on this page, we can actually see how much power usage this server is using right now. And to be honest, 126 watts, that's not all that bad, but it could be a bit better. Now, if I scroll down a bit, we can see that right here, it actually peaked to 204. So it does fluctuate a bit based on the load, but at this time of night, there's really not a lot going on. Although starting at about midnight, the power usage is actually probably going to go up because that's when all of my backup jobs start kicking off and those are encrypted. So it does take a little bit of CPU power to get those backups done. But again, this isn't using an extreme amount of power, but I do feel it could be better and that's one of the goals of this new build that I'm going to be putting together. But what are we actually building? So the motherboard that I am going to be putting in the new server is this one right here. Here we can see the entire model number of this board. And then we can also get some specs for this as well. And this product page, it tells me that it has an Intel Atom C3758 CPU. If I'm not mistaken, there's a bug in the C2000 series that can result in bricking your motherboard. So that's one reason why I wanted to go new. I didn't need something brand new, but I certainly didn't want to buy something that was going to be possibly bricked. And here we can see the CPU has a maximum rated power draw of 25 watts, which is actually going to be more power efficient than my R710. And you can get some more specs here, like how much RAM you can actually put on this motherboard. I'll have a link to this motherboard in the description below this video. But we can also compare the CPUs side by side. So here on CPU World, I plugged in the model number of the CPU in the FreeNAS currently, and also the one on the one that I'm building. So again, the new server is going to have this Intel Atom C3758 CPU, and then my current FreeNAS server has an L5630 CPU. And there's going to be some pros and cons here because the board that I chose isn't better than the previous one in every category. In fact, the R710 might still actually outperform the brand new motherboard in some areas. But that's not really important to me because, again, my goals are to have a more quiet data center, and also to have more power efficient resources as well. And the new motherboard definitely delivers that. As you can see right here, it tells me that the CPU in the new motherboard is 38% more efficient than the old one. And if I scroll down a bit here, we get some fancy graphs so you can actually see how the two CPUs differ from one another. So the blue bar is going to represent the Xeon L5630 that's in the R710, while the green is going to represent the new Intel Atom C3758, which is on the new motherboard. Now, as you can see here, they both have eight cores. That's pretty cool. But we can also see here that the L5630 actually has a higher operating frequency than the new one. But that again, that's not really something that matters to me. But we're going to see here that we have more cache. And then here we have actual better thermal design power on the new motherboard. So according to this, it seems like it's going to meet my goals. And then here we get some pros and cons. So to be honest, I mean, there, this is a significant drawback right here that might sway people to avoid this particular motherboard as it states you really can't replace the CPU on this motherboard. That's true, it's built in. So if the CPU goes 
or the motherboard goes, they both go. And I did understand and I do acknowledge that risk. And I understood that before I bought it. It really wasn't something that I was concerned with because I didn't really feel like there's really a big chance of that happening. There's a bigger chance of a hard drive failing in a server like this than the motherboard. But again, you have to weigh the pros and the cons. Now the Atom actually has more actual cores, but as we see here, the Xeon is upgradable. So that's a pretty significant benefit of the Xeon and the R710. In fact, the L5630 CPU that's in there right now is not even the one that it came with. I did downgrade that. The L stands for low power usage or something like that. L series Xeons use less power than normal Xeons. So it would actually be using a little bit more power had I not downgraded the CPU. But again, I already understood all the pros and cons, and well, this is the direction that I decided to go. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and build this server. So now what I'm going to do is show you guys each individual component, and then we're going to go ahead and put it together. So first of all, if you want to build a server, you'll definitely need some sort of chassis to put the parts into, otherwise it's just going to look weird. And for that, I decided to go with this D400 case from iStar USA. Now before today, I've never owned any of their products, so I don't really know what to expect beyond the reviews that I've read. But of all the cases that I found on Amazon, I just decided to go with this one. It looks really cool. It's going to fit my needs. It's big, so it has room for airflow and lots of hard drives. Definitely something you'll need for a storage server. And it seems like a good fit overall. And you'll know by the end of the video how I really feel about this case. But so far, based on what I've read, it seems like a good fit for my use case. In addition to that, we are also able to open up the front, so I'll go ahead and do that. We have two front panels that open right up, which is pretty neat. So all in all, it seems like a good fit for a storage server. So I'll be putting all the parts in here in just a moment. But next up, I'm going to show you guys the power supply. So here's the power supply that I've decided to go with. This is from Antec. It's an 80 plus bronze power supply and it's considered a green power supply. It's 80 plus bronze, so it's supposed to be more power efficient and have a reasonably quiet fan. Now I know some people get very passionate about the power supply choice. I'm not really passionate about that kind of thing because the way I see it, as long as it powers the computer, it doesn't burn up and it's not super loud, I'm generally fine with it. So this is the direction that I decided to go, this power supply right here. So if you have any opinions on this choice, go ahead and let me know in the comments below. But I won't spend a whole lot of time talking about the power supply because, at least to me, it's not really something that's very exciting. But here it is, for better or worse, and I'll definitely know how I feel about it when I get the build completed. But I think based on the reviews, it should be a good choice. And speaking of not very exciting, I have this generic brown box right here. You could probably guess what's inside. Yes, that's right, this is a hard drive. I have four of these. I decided to go with the Seagate Iron Wolf drive, and this is a six terabyte drive. And with four of these, I'm going to end up with about 12 terabytes if you account for two drives being parity. So, you know, that's going to be enough storage for me because I don't store a ton. And I could have gone with the eight terabyte drive, but I did, you know, spend quite a bit of money on the other parts. So I wanted to kind of cut costs somewhere. And I think that this is going to be reasonable. I've done some reviews and found that the Seagate Iron Wolf drives are considered to be a good choice for a NAS unit nowadays. So that's why I decided to go along with this. I've mentioned earlier in the video that one of the goals was being very power efficient. I want my NAS to use as little power as possible. And that's when I found this right here. I did some research and to be fair, this one is a little expensive. This is a super micro motherboard. It's supposed to use a very low amount of watts. I guess we'll see when I measure it once we get it put together but it has a built-in Intel Atom processor. It has eight cores, just eight cores and eight threads. But for me, that's enough because I'm not like using this NAS for a bunch of users or anything like that. At the end of the day, it's just me and eight cores is probably overkill. I would have saved a lot of money by going with the four core version, but I decided not to because from the reviews I've read, 
it actually has additional slowdown because of some way that it shares resources via the same bus. And this version, it's not that I needed eight cores, it's just that it wasn't going to have the same performance penalty and it still does actually save a lot of power. Now the processor is built in, it's an all-in-one unit. So unfortunately the problem is if the motherboard dies, well, everything dies. So I, yes, I know that is a problem, but from what I have researched, I was unable to find another solution that was going to offer the same power savings. So that's why I decided to go along with this. And again, it is an Intel Atom board. You have to be careful with that because there are certain Intel Atom processors that have a bricking issue based on my research. And seeing the word brick in reviews is enough to make me stay away from a motherboard, believe me. And this one should not have that problem. So that's why I decided to go along with this. Now, normally I would tell you what the model number is and everything. I'll put that information in the show notes below this video. I'm just too lazy to read the model number. It's really long. And I mean, it can't be good marketing to have a long model number. But from what I've heard and the reviews I've read, this should be a good choice for my storage server. So this is what we're going to be putting in the server. And I'm gonna do a quick unboxing. This isn't really an unboxing video or anything like that, but let's go ahead and take it out of the box. So what do we have in here? We have a parts list, nothing too exciting there. And we get some documentation about the headers and things like that. Basically standard issue motherboard stuff. And a plethora of cables. We have some silver SATA cables. Wow, I have never actually seen silver SATA cables. I, I guess I've never really cared too much about SATA cables as long as they have good reviews and they're not going to uh, flip some bits. They're generally fine. And then some. we have some red ones. Of course we have the backplane plate. Another SATA cable, another SATA cable. I have, guys, a ton of SATA cables now. As if I didn't already have a whole box full of these things. Now I have a bunch more. And then the motherboard itself. I have to kind of take all the foam to get it out. And here it is. It's very small. This is mini ITX. So again, I'm going for power usage efficiency, low power usage, basically. And, you know, everything's integrated on the board. It's a very small board. And, and, you know, the chassis, this thing is going to look extremely small inside the chassis. But I'm okay with that. More airflow. So um, you'll see this motherboard a lot better in the, in the remainder of the video when I actually go ahead and put this in the case and start building it. But uh, this is, again, a super micro 8-core Intel Atom motherboard. So I'm really excited to get this thing installed. And of course we will need some RAM in our server, otherwise it won't even boot. So I decided to go along with this. It's a stick of Samsung ECC memory. It's only 16 gigabytes. I figured that's enough for now. Again, I'm only one user. I'll probably buy another stick of RAM just like this one because with only one stick of RAM, I can't benefit from memory interleaving. But for now, I think this is a good starting point. For the boot volume, I decided to go with this Kingston SSD right here. And this is an A400 SSD, it's NVMe. As you can see, it's 120 gigabytes, which admittedly is overkill because this only needs enough room to store the operating system. And this is the smallest, cheapest one that I could find. I wanted NVMe for the boot volume because I want the server to start as fast as possible. And I also want the user interface of the NAS to be as fast as possible as well. And I think that this will actually do the job just nicely. So the problem with the case, one of the biggest weaknesses, is that while it does have doors on the front that open, they're practically useless because there's no hard drive mounts in those bays at all. So you still have to mount the hard drives to the inside of the case. So to fill that void and to fix that flaw, I decided to buy this. Now I actually have four of these, one for each of the hard drives. This will give me the ability to easily slide in or out a hard drive in the front. It's a mobile rack and all it is is a five and a quarter to a three and a half inch adapter that allows you to put a hard drive essentially where a optical drive would normally go. Now it sucks that the case doesn't already come with a way of easily removing hard drives or adding hard drives, 
But this right here is actually going to compensate just nicely and give me the functionality that I feel the case should have in the first place. I also mentioned near the beginning of the video that one of the things I wanted to achieve with this case is to make it as quiet as possible. So I decided to go with this Noctua Redux fan right here. So I'll go ahead and take it out of the box. And as you can see, it's just a simple fan. And here's the fan itself. I mean, nothing too surprising here, it's just a fan. But, you know, these are supposed to be the quieter fans. And I decided to give that a shot and see if that's true. So this is the fan that I'll actually be mounting into the case. All right, so here's the top view of the case. And what I'm gonna do is just open it up and show you the internal side. And then I'm going to install the individual parts. Now, I apologize, I wasn't able to get the camera up high enough, so the uh, camera is going to look a little weird here, but you know, I don't have the greatest tripod in the world, so I'm trying my best. And there's some screws on the side, I'll go ahead and remove those. And you can't see it, but there's one in the back as well. So now we can start to get a look at what's inside this case. So you weren't able to see it, but there was a brown box in the back side of the case. Here it is right here. Let's see what's inside. And let's see. We have a bunch of screws. We have some uh, slot covers and some zip ties. Um, basically standard stuff for a case. This piece of paper here, what does this say? Um, some kind of uh, inspection sheet, I guess. Eh, nothing too exciting. So I'll go ahead and move this around a bit. We have all the various cables that are going to be connecting case to the motherboard. So I'll get these out of the way. So next I'm going to attach the standoffs for the motherboard. So next I'm going to go ahead and attach the back plate. And here it is right here. Now a quick word about this. I found this a little annoying. You'll notice that some of these are punched out and then some of them are not. I had to be selective over which ones I punched out. It appears to me that this must be some kind of generic back plate that might be used for different motherboards. So you definitely don't want to punch all of these out only the ones that you actually have to. Otherwise, you'll be letting some unnecessary air into your case. Just go ahead and line it up to your motherboard and just make sure that you're punching out the right ones. So I'll go ahead and put this in the case. And again, I'm sorry you weren't able to see that. I don't have the best tripod in the world, so, you know, doing the best I can with what I have. Next up, we have the motherboard. I'll go ahead and try to get this into frame here. And here is the super micro motherboard that I decided to go with. And again, the model number will be in the description below this video. But this is an Intel Atom motherboard. Again, eight cores. We have four RAM slots here. And we have four SATA slots that I'm able to see. Now this does have a cooling fan, even though this is a system on chip kind of processor. And not all the models have this. I believe if it has a plus in the name, it has a cooling fan. And if it doesn't, then well, it doesn't. I'm not 100% sure of that, but it does appear to be the case. Now interesting right here, we have a USB 3 port, which is pretty cool because, you know, FreeNAS, which is what I use, can be installed on a flash drive, but if you did decide to go that direction, you can have your flash drive inside the case. This is actually kind of common with servers. If you have a flash drive that you don't want removed, then you could go ahead and attach it right here inside the case and you don't have to worry about the uh, flash drive being disconnected. Then on the back, we can see the various ports that we have. 
There's a dedicated port for IPMI for remote management. We also have four other NICs as well. These are gigabit ports as I understand it. Of course, we have VGA as well, but this is a server, so I'll probably never be using that, um, you know, aside from the initial power on, of course. Of course, we have some USB ports on the back as well. Nothing too surprising there. And if you're curious what the underside looks like, well, here it is. And, you know, when it comes to the other components on the motherboard, we have the standard suspects. So I'll go ahead and I won't talk about every single component, but, you know, here's the motherboard. So hopefully this was a good choice. I'll go ahead and put it in the case now. I'll see if I can get this moved forward at least a little bit. So again, apologies about my tripod, but at least you can see how little this motherboard is compared to the rest of the case. It's tiny. So now I'm going to go ahead and, well, screw it in. Okay, so motherboard is in. And for the fan, I'll go ahead and plug it in. This is the fan that comes with the case. I'm going to give you guys a quick look at that. This is the rear of the case right here. You can see the fan that it came with. There's room for another fan if I'd like to put in another fan. Of course, right here we have the finished back plate with the proper holes punched out. Again, be careful with that. So the motherboard is in. Now it's time to get the power supply in place. All right, and this is probably a better view of the case. I probably should have went with this camera angle before, but I guess, you know, can't change the past. So let's get that power supply in. So I'll go ahead and center this. So I just opened up the box and this is what it looks like. So I'll carefully remove this out of the box. And here's the power supply. This is, well, can't say I've ever seen packaging like this before, but I guess it's fine. A little piece of paper around it, that's weird. And here's the power supply. I'm just going to show various angles of it. See what it looks like. It's not a modular power supply. I, you know, went the cheap route here. So we have all these cables that I may or may not use, but it's good enough for now. So nothing too surprising so far. Okay, so here's the other side I didn't show. If you guys are curious, go ahead and put this in the case. I have to maneuver around this top bar. I guess I probably could have just, you know, unscrewed it and took it off, but I'm lazy. Okay, there we go. All right, so that's in. Go ahead and unravel some of these cables. Of our standard issue motherboard cables here. So, Go ahead and get this plugged in. So the power supply is in. I'll worry about cable management in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and switch gears and get the hard drives put in.
Okay, so at this point, I've gone ahead and installed the new server in the rack. It's in a temporary position right now, which is why I'm not going to show the rack at this point in the video. I did power it on for a bit to check out the BIOS and things like that, but the server is actually off right now. What you're actually seeing on the screen right now is the IPMI interface. So even though the server is not powered on, I am able to basically connect to the console of the server so it does have enough power to run this console and that'll let me log in and I can basically control the server from the LAN. For some reason, I wasn't initially able to access this console at all. The default username and password is supposed to be admin and admin respectively, but that didn't work. And I also did some Google searching and there's some variations of that. None of that worked for me. I actually had to boot the server and reset the password in order to access it. So I'm not really sure why I needed to do that. If it's a brand new board, it really should be admin and admin. That's also what the documentation for the board claims as well. But anyway, I am able to access it now. So let's check it out. And here we have the actual interface for the IPMI. This is pretty cool. So what I'm going to attempt to do is install FreeNAS. That's what I've decided to go with via this console so that you can basically see the entire process. What I've done off camera is I went to virtual media and then CD-ROM image. I've entered the host name of my existing current FreeNAS server. And then the path right here to a Windows file share that currently has the FreeNAS ISO saved inside it. And then I clicked on the mount button. And then when I clicked on refresh status, this changed right here to say there is an ISO file mounted. So basically that means that it should actually work. So I'll go to remote control and let's go to IKVM HTML5. Click on the magic button here. Let's see what happens. So my browser apparently doesn't support recording video. That's fine, I don't really care. Now obviously the server is not on right now, so that's why you see nothing. So I'll go ahead and power it on. There we go, so the server's starting up. And then when it comes up, I'm going to press F11 for the boot menu. I can catch it in time. I think I have to wait till after the USB devices are detected, if I'm not mistaken. There it goes, it says invoking boot menu, so it should actually do exactly that. And the first time this server started up, it did take quite a while. So if you get a board like this one, it's totally normal. Server boards aren't really known for really fast boot, but that's okay. So anyway, we have the boot menu right here. And I've never actually done this before using media remotely to boot a server. So let's see if this works. So I'm going to go down here to, I assume this is the right one, virtual CD-ROM. I'll press enter. And I assume it's going to take a bit longer to boot from a network ISO file, but here it is. Wow, look at this. The free NAS Boot screen is right there, so it is booting off the virtual CD drive. That's pretty sweet. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and press enter on the first option, install slash upgrade. And it's asking me which hard drive I'd like to install FreeNAS on. And by the way, I know this is a Linux channel and FreeNAS is not a Linux solution, but it's less about what I'm installing and more so about the overall use case because you could simply replace FreeNAS with Open Media Vault or straight Debian if you'd like. But anyway, I'll press the space bar to put an asterisk in the first option there. That's the Kingston NVMe SSD. And I'm going to leave all the other hard drives deselected because those are the hard drives that will make up the volume for storage. So I'll press enter. Proceed with installation. Sure, why not? Enter. And I need to set the root password, so I'll give it a temporary one for now. Boot via UEFI is fine. And swap, why not?
Okay, so it looks like everything was installed. So if all goes well, it should boot into FreeNAS. So let's see if that happens. Go ahead and reboot it. And here we have FreeNAS booting. So, so far so good. All right, as you see here, we have an IP address. And actually with my router slash firewall, basically PFSense, I don't even need to remember that because I could simply type in the host name, which simply defaults to FreeNAS. So let's go ahead and see if I can get in. And sure enough, we have a login page. And there we go. I've successfully logged into FreeNAS. This is the new server right here. We're all set and ready to go. Now the next stage, of course, is for me to migrate all of my data from the old server to the new one. So what I should actually do right now is create the pool with the new hard drive. So I'll go here to pools. And of course, we don't have any, so I'll click add. I'll create a new one. For the name, I'm going to give it volume one, just like that. And I'll enable encryption. Let's confirm that. Then for the disk, these are the disks right here that I expect to see, the four that I haven't already used because the only other hard drive I have is the NVMe drive, which this is running off of. So I'll just go ahead and select all of the drives, add them right here. And it is auto-suggesting RAID Z2, which is the option that I wanted anyway. And it gives me the estimated capacity that I'll have right here, 10 terabytes or roughly 10 terabytes, which is actually more than I had in the previous pool. Now, basically, the reason why I don't need more than that is because I do archive a lot of stuff off-site. So 10 terabytes is probably more than I need. I think I'll be fine with that. And I'll click on Create. And I'll confirm. And I will download the encryption key for safekeeping, just in case I need to recover data later. And it did complete, so I'll click Done. And now we have the actual pool right here. Volume 1 has been created. That's pretty cool. Now I don't have any data sets here. So what I'm going to do right now is start the long process of transferring data from the current FreeNAS, the one that's running on my R710, to this new one. This is the old server right here in this tab. Here we can see all the data sets that I have. So I'm going to click on Tasks, and then Replication Tasks right here. I'll add a new task. So Source Data Set will be on this system. And then I'll pick something very small to start out, something that shouldn't take a whole lot of time. And I think this Clonezilla data set, although it does have a decent amount of data in there, it's probably the least data that I have, or at least the smallest data set. So different system. Username will be root. I'll put in the password here. Then the new URL right here, freenas.homenetwork.io. I'll probably change that later. Create SSH connection. So apparently I needed to add this part here, so let's try this again. Then here I'm going to go ahead and create the data set. Put the name in there. Save it. We have that data set. So back here on my old unit. So I'm going to go ahead and fill out this information right here. So I'll just call it sync clonezilla. Do root for the user. And then we'll do the source. That's going to be this one right here, Clonezilla. We'll do target.
and then I'll go ahead and save it. So now we have the Clonezilla transfer replication task. So let's see what happens. Let's go ahead and run it. The task has started. Current state is pending and it aired out unfortunately. Let's see why. Okay, so apparently I need to change the option replication from scratch, so that should be fine. There we go, I've enabled the option, I'll save it. Let's go ahead and run this again. And it started. It says that it's running. And it looks like it's actually transferring data, that's pretty cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this run and then I'll come back and check on it later. All right, so it looks like it finished. We have the log right here that shows me basically what all it did. And then over here, we of course have the data set. And right now it's, it's telling me there's 127 Kibby bytes used, but of course I didn't refresh this page yet. So I'll just refresh it. And we can see now that there is some used space in there. So it looks like the transfer was in fact successful. So off camera, what I'm going to do is just go ahead and migrate the rest of my data over to this new server. So the build is all done. It took me several days to fine tune my new FreeNAS server. And it took a while to copy all of my data from the old server to the new server, but it's in the rack, it's all done. And I'm happy to report that this project was a complete success. In fact, my FreeNAS server is running at 55 watts, give or take. What I'm overlaying on the screen right now is the actual kilowatt meter that I plugged the server into so you can see what the actual power usage is on this unit. And the good news doesn't end there. Not only am I benefiting from power savings on my new FreeNAS server, I've actually managed to get the power usage of my entire rack down to just 140 watts on average. And no, I'm not kidding. Everything on my server rack equates to around 140 watts. Now, how did I accomplish that? Well, spoiler alert, I've actually also built a new Proxmox server as well that's also energy efficient. And I've already recorded the footage for that video, which I am going to start editing right now and I hope to get that video out as soon as I possibly can. But with the new FreeNAS server and the new Proxmox server, I have a very energy efficient rack that's not going to be resulting in a very large electric bill. Now, if you haven't already done so, be sure you subscribe to my channel because you'll be the first to get notified as soon as I have the Proxmox video out. I can't wait to show you that build, it's awesome. But in the meantime, what do you guys think of my FreeNAS build? Do you like the idea of an energy efficient FreeNAS server? Let me know in the comments below. And if you have any questions, let me know those as well. And let me know what you guys decided to build. If you have your own FreeNAS server, what did you go with? How did you build it? Let's talk about HomeLab in the comments below. But anyway, I hope that was helpful for you guys and I'll see you in the next video.